Today, in the 21st century, it is the World Trade Organization that has adapted David Ricardo's ideas. Elle a été très bien expliquée à l'époque par Monsieur Ricardo. Elle est toute simple. Hein? Euh, C'est que si vous faites quelque chose mieux que moi, et si je fais quelque chose mieux que vous, alors nous avons tous les deux intérêt à ouvrir notre échange. Je vais bénéficier de votre savoir-faire, vous allez bénéficier de mon savoir-faire. Ça, c'est ce que dit Ricardo, en gros. 60 Second Adventures in Economics. Fear of foreign competition once led countries to try and produce everything they needed and impose heavy taxes to keep out foreign goods. However, economist David Ricardo showed that international trade could actually make everyone better off, bringing in one of the first great economic models. Ricardo even gave the theory a name, comparative advantage. The theory was born out of a violent debate at the time over a high tariff on the importation of wheat, then called corn, thus keeping the price of bread high. It was Ricardo's way to fight the power of local landlords, encourage competition, and lower the price of bread. Ricardo noticed the following. He says, look, imagine that England and Portugal, each one produces two goods. So he says cloth and wine. You see, you're producing two things, I'm producing two things. I'm better at producing this thing here, cloth. And you're better at producing wine. So why should I be producing cloth and wine when I can specialize, get my comparative advantage, my particular advantage at producing cloth and produce more cloth, so I'll be producing more than you know, if I specialize in both things. And then you that are better off at producing wine, you specialize in producing wine and you'll be better off. By specializing, they can then export these surpluses to each other and both end up better off. This is the principle of comparative advantage. Il avait des hypothèses extrêmement particulières. Il y avait plein emploi, tous les pays avaient accès à la même technologie. Donc il y avait, comme les magiciens, si vous voulez, il y avait un truc. On a oublié le truc et on a vendu comme universel la loi que tous les pays ont intérêt à utiliser. Et alors, dans, à une époque où il y a quelques cyniques, on a utilisé de façon rhétorique ce résultat théorique pour forcer les marchés. In the Mexican countryside, free trade is not seen as a promise, but as a threat with the opening of the country to cheaper U.S. corn. Las gentes esas que están ahí al frente de secretarías y eso hacen este políticas agrícolas o agroalimentarias, agropecuarias. No a nosotros, por ejemplo, no nos espanta el Tratado de Libre Comercio, pero yo siento que nosotros, bueno, como agricultor y como campesino que somos, estamos en desigualdad de circunstancias. Por ejemplo, los productores gringos tienen muchos apoyos, muchos subsidios. Nosotros nos dan el por campo de 1,100, 1,200 pesos por hectárea. But how did Ricardo reconcile the reality of seeking cheap labor and new markets with his vision of a win-win for all? There are two important causes that are made explicit in his book. One, everybody that you know, loses a job in the production of uh, cloth in Portugal has to get a job in the production of wine in, you know, in Portugal, and vice versa in England. So everybody that was producing wine has to get a job producing cloth. So there is an intrinsic assumption that people can find jobs. Ricardo very explicit, says no capital mobility. So you have to assume that the capitalist that is deciding to produce the cloth because you're good here, because you have the technology, doesn't have the following idea. Wait a second. They don't produce anything. They have very low wages. They're willing to work for peanuts. What if I take my technology here and move it to the other country and produce from there and just sell here? Solution, 
so GM leaving Flint had nothing to do with free trade or David Ricardo, but everything to do with a search for cheaper labor.